at Sinking Creek Organic Farms in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. It is a CSA farm and we're here with Farmer Dan and they've got a lot going on. Farmer Dan, I love that name. Can you please tell us where we're standing here today? Well, Sherry, welcome to Sinking Creek Farm. Thanks. We are standing in our educational plot and we designed this plot with uh, both children and adults in mind and wanted to just show them several different types of planting techniques. Uh, different plant varieties and give them just an overview in a very small area. And one of the techniques that I saw this year was a bucket system. And what this is, is just a standard bucket, four holes drilled in the bottom, and it enables me to put my compost in the bucket, fill that with water, keep the water off the leaves of the tomato, and almost like a slow drip fertilization system all in one. Do you always keep water in there or do you just let it kind of seep down through naturally and then when it gets low come back? Ab about once a week. Okay. Sometimes in the heat of the summer and actually when it has set fruit, I give it just a little bit more, but usually it's just a feel thing. I sort of check on it and if, it, if I think it needs it, I'll fill it up one and more And what time. is the advantage for not getting water on the leaves of tomatoes? Well, it keeps some of the blights from splashing up on the, on the leaves, some of the black spot and, and it won't eliminate it 100%. One of the things people, everybody now likes to go with heirlooms and, and the heirlooms are a little bit more susceptible sometimes to our wet weather and we don't want to you know make that worse by watering uh, on the leaves. I saw something interesting behind us I would like to go check out is your mason bee house. Okay let's go. Well everybody's familiar with honeybees and and know a lot of their habits and traits. One of the bees that is is really new to us and we're, we're excited about it is the mason bee or the orchard bee and uh, one of the advantages to a mason bee is that it stays really close. So it, instead of flying over some of our vegetables and fruit trees, it would stay right here in our area and pollinate that for us. This was made by a Cub Scout troop here. They actually got three or four of their badges for doing this. They harvested the bamboo, they cut each piece and built this little condo around it and stuck those in there. So what, you, what a mason bee does is lay its eggs inside the little tubes and fills it with a little bit of mud. There, there's the name, the mason. Mm -hmm. And uh, then those, those in the spring will chew their way out and pollinate and do the same thing over and over. Dan, I noticed you had traditional honeybees over there. I sort of did a mentoring program with a local apiary, Llewellyn Apiaries, and they first helped us out and got us started with bees. And these are Langstrom hives. They're the traditional hives that you see with the frames inside. And we have two of those. And as you can see today, they are, they busy. are doing great. and Busy little very, bees. Busy little <laughs> bees, exactly. Dan, you've got quite a cute little setup here for your chickens. How do you the chickens contribute to your gardens here? Well, we always say that the chickens are the ultimate composters. Any of the, the broken leaves or yellowed leaves or leftover produce, they'll gladly take it and eat it. And they produce a compost that is fantastic for growing things. Now we let that season a little bit. We don't put it in there green, mm -hmm. but after about a season, that stuff is just unbelievable. Gosh, Dan, we're standing next to some yummies in your tummies. <laughs> What are we standing by? Well, this is one of our pride and joys. It is uh, our blackberry patch, and we, we love these uh, thornless blackberries. This is a uh, Navajo variety here, and uh, a lot of people, when they first came out, thought some of those varieties didn't have the flavor, but in that Navajo and the Arapaho as well is another one we grow. They are fantastic, and none of the thorns, n none of the thorns that we all had to deal with in the old days. Tell me a little bit about how you planted this for a normal person if they wanted to plant blackberries. What, what do they need and what do they have to do? Well, we're, we're kind of abide by the bulletproof philosophy around here. We actually dug a hole, put a little compost in it, put the blackberry in it, kept it watered. It's, it's, really, it's really simple. They don't really need any special care in Tennessee. And I noticed they're not on drip or anything this time of the year. They're not. We, we want them to feel a little bit threatened. That pushes the fruit count high. So when they feel like they're, they're having a little bit of problem, they will put on more fruit. What about to keep the birds off now that they are coming into fruit? Do you have well, to net them at all? I, I don't net them. I, Netting in the past has caught birds in the net and it's, it's just been really messy. What we do is try to hustle and get out here and get them picked every morning when they're ready and we've done a pretty good job of that. We, we don't mind giving the birds a few, but mm -hmm. we, we like to stay two or three steps ahead of them. 
Oh, Dan, I see some tall beauties behind us. What do you got going on there? We, we've got an experiment in hops going back here. This is, this is a, a couple of years of these vines growing, and uh, we have some friends that brew beer, and they do a wet hop. Uh, brew and when these come in they they fight over them. So do you give them hops and then they give you the brew? Is that how it works? Uh, that's how it works. That's exactly Seems how, like it, a fair that's exactly how yes. it works. Yes. And then I noticed in front of us I'm wanted to talk to you a bit about your squash. Squash pose a lot of problems with insects and you will Tell us a little bit about how you take care of them organically. Well, there's, there's several problems that can happen with the squash. Uh, this time of year, uh, the squash have squash bugs. And, um, you know, organically, the squash bug is a pretty tough bug, even when you're spraying chemicals on it. Mm -hmm. So what we try to do are a couple of things. One, we, um, we kill them uh, manually. We, if you water down in the base of a, of a squash, those squash bug adults will come up and you can readily uh, squeeze those, kill those, capture those, uh, whatever you choose. Also, you wanna look for the uh, squash bug eggs on, on the leaves. They are uh, sort of a shiny red cluster. And if you can just break those loose, if, if they're not attached, they, they won't hatch. Now in your CSA baskets, do you provide the squash blossoms as well as the, the fruit or? We, ha we have, we have a, a couple of customers who are really in, uh, uh, probably chefs and mm -hmm. at least a home chef. Mm -hmm. And they do, they have stuffed and fried those mm -hmm. and uh, say they are delicious. Tell us some of the other problems. Well, vine borers are a problem on squash. They're, they're not a problem now. They, it, it'll be a couple of weeks to a month before they're a problem. And what that is is a moth that lays its egg in a hole in the stem. And those uh, little caterpillars just eat that squash from the inside out. So it's the situation where you're, in the morning your squash will look beautiful and full, and in the afternoon it, it falls down. Um, We've tried several remedies to keep those off of there. Our, our, the best thing we do is use a small X-Acto knife. Once we see they're in there and we will cut a small slit in the, skin, in the stem, uh, I'll use a piece of wire to pull those two, uh, usually two uh, caterpillars out, and then we will uh, put a little dirt over that break in the stem. Okay, this sounds like it's a lot of work first thing in the morning. Tell me how your day begins. What's the first thing you do when you come out into your gardens? The first thing I do is take care of my chickens. Okay. Chickens wait for no man. Mm -hmm. So I have to water and feed the chickens and collect the eggs. And then I systematically go from planting area to planting area, doing a series of checks. Mo most of the th things with organic are preventative. If you can get in there and prevent some things, then you're-, you're Stay on top of it. Stay on top of it. And that, that is the challenge for not only farmers, but gardeners as well, is to stay on top of weeds, pests, fungus, and, and all of that. And, and and that, that is a uh, challenge that we, we try to meet daily. I've noticed, Dan, that with every farmer and gardener, they're always looking on to the next. Bigger is better. And I noticed behind you, you did something different this year in, in plans for the future. Tell us a little bit about what you did. We did. We, we took an area that needed a little TLC, and in, instead of going back to the way it was before, we, we decided to build a vineyard and it's 12,000 square feet. Uh, it's not completely full of grapes yet. We already had some grapes, so we transplanted those. We'll fill that up in the, in the spring, and uh, we, we feel like that's gonna be a beautiful addition to the farm. I want you to mention about what your and your wife, Ginger, or Gigi as she goes by, his passion is here. Not just the actual production of your vegetables and of your flowers and things, but rather education for adults and for children. Can you talk to us about that, please? Well, we have learned so much since we, we started farming from older farmers and just individuals uh, in the community. And we really wanna pass that along. So we take any opportunity we can to have a workshop. Uh, we do children's interactive workshops uh, with several stations. We do canning workshops, fermenting workshops. And uh, the, what we've noticed is even if it's, a, if it's a children's interactive workshop, the adults get as much out of that as well. And that's something that we really enjoy doing. There was something you mentioned and we just glazed over it super fast, but fermentation workshop, a lot of people don't know what that is. Mention that to us, please. Well, a couple of things, we, we, items that we do. We do a kimchi, which is a traditional Korean uh, fermented cabbage uh, with, with a lot of different recipes, but we have one that we do. We also did a traditional 
German kraut. We did it in the crock. Uh, we did, did some jardinera, some pickled beets, some uh, pickled ginger and carrots. Uh, we, just, we just really have, uh, feel like spreading that word of lacto-fermentation and the health benefit are something we really want to do with our friends and friends of friends. So your garden and your farm is in, evolving into so much more. Every day, sometimes we, we don't even recognize it, it evolves so much. Sinking Creek Farm is a working organic farm. It is the local farm in Murfreesboro, and not only is it producing great vegetables, but it's pretty too. For more information, please visit volunteergardener.org.